The single greatest all-American action hero, John McClane, has killed 73 people throughout five Die Hard movies over 25 years. And the epic Greek war hero Odysseus, a fictional character known for his abilities as a warrior, killed around 200 people in 15 years of war and travel in one of the bloodiest displays in Greek legend. The deadliest sniper alive right now is a British Marine whose identity is a closely guarded secret because the government is worried that if his name gets out, he'll become a target of extremist terrorists. He has 173 confirmed kills. My character in Fallout 4 has killed over 900 people in the 30 days since he's left Vault 111. What the fuck? Most of those were raiders and defenseless scientists of the Institute, but if you include super mutants and synths, and my total confirmed sentient lives ended totals well over 2,000. And if you include my other Fallout 4 characters, the number jumps to over 5,000. But that's just raiders, super mutants, synths, and the occasional evil scientists. It's, it's no big deal, right? Well, actually, it's not just them. It's also the Geth. Mercenaries, uh, all the henchmen I punched in the head with my Olympian fists and then left on the floor of Arkham Asylum, their brains swelling without any medical attention. The, it's the orcs of Mordor and the Falmer and bandits of Skyrim. It's stormtroopers, dark Jedi, soldiers, pedophiles, and like every single pixel in Hotline Miami. And it's a blur. I think I might be a sociopath. Well, no, wait, no, that can't be right because if that were right, then CBS would be right about everything. And and you'd all be sociopaths too. And and. Some of you might be. I mean, it is the internet after all, but all of you? No, no way. But isn't it kind of weird that almost every single game with a combat mechanic in it just has wave after wave of forgettable shithead bullet fodder in it? Well, weird, maybe, yes, but it's not new. Not by a long shot. You, remember the Odyssey that I mentioned earlier and like the 200 men that Odysseus killed? Yeah, like half of them were just nameless dudes who were trying to bang his wife. I mean, say what you want about mowing down dozens of raiders in 10 minutes, but at least they had the audacity to shoot at you first. This trope, the one of completely disposable henchmen, is as old as storytelling. Tale is old as time. No, Austin, no copyright strikes today. In the essay Disembodied Violence in the Fantasy Tradition, Mark Philip Powick talks about the war portrayed in the Iliad, the prelude to the Odyssey, which details the War of Troy and how heroes like I Need Better Shoes Achilles fight through insignificant hordes of warriors on their way to destiny. This violence, the, the, the one against mooks, is disembodied because it's committed against what are, narratively speaking, non-humans. They're just like, you know, human-shaped blob things against which the mighty hero gets to dull his epic sword of mook slaying plus one against. It's, it's not real violence because it doesn't happen to a real person. I mean, think about the raiders in Fallout or the mooks in the Arkham series. I mean, how much characterization is really going on here? Maybe in an overheard conversation talking about how fun it was stomping on baby skulls for laughs or for pocket change, or maybe drug use or addiction. Usually the only characterization that these hordes of nobodies get serves to emphasize how bad and lacking in well-deserved brain skull bat spankings they are. The, the only time that violence is really violence in these settings is when two narratively significant characters meet. Like when Fallout 4 spoiler warning. Like like when you meet Kellogg in Fallout 4 and confront him about why he stole your baby and killed your spouse. Kellogg is a dangerous, cold-blooded, calculating, fucking nigh immortal brick machine. This isn't Achilles plowing through dozens of copy-pasted skin bags. This is Achilles' face-off with Hector, Prince of Troy, and resident goddamn badass. It's in these pivotal moments where the violence becomes real. It's the meeting of equals. Kellogg, hardened veteran agent of the Institute, and the sole survivor, who spent every last moment outside of the vault turning everything that stands in her way into toothpaste, fighting with grit and determination for this moment. These are no mooks. These are legends. Th this structure is so ubiquitous that it spans into genres that aren't even epic stories. So it's old 
and tried and true. I mean, if it's good enough for Homer, it should be good enough for us, right? I mean, we could just, we could just call the episode right here. Or maybe not. I mean, just because something has always been a certain way doesn't mean that it's not worth looking at more closely. So what about these non-people? You know, the ones that Achilles turns into German pancake batter on the battlefield? Well, they're actual people. You know, peasants, actually, you, you know, poor people. Poor people who dropped everything they were doing, but not by choice, by the way, to come fight a war for their king's boner. Uh, king's honor, their king's honor. And at the end of the day, bandits and raiders are just poor shitholes who are trying to survive under like the worst circumstances. But who else is desperate enough to shoot someone over pocket change? Henchmen in Gotham are mostly poor people or, or mentally ill people who live in Gotham, a, a city of goddamn freaks. I mean, you try living as a truly desperate person in a town with the Joker, Penguin, and Two-Face. Yeah, you probably be a weirdo too. You know, I had the most amazing experience the other day while I was playing Broforce, a game that at first glance seems to be all about expendability of characters. About halfway through the game, I ran into this amazing scene telling the story about one insignificant terrorist character from birth to his first love to training to his proudest professional moments, all, all before showing him exploding into just a blob of wet carbon. Shows like uh, Venture Brothers also play with humanizing henchmen. Do you see the pattern here? I mean, treating henchmen as actual people is so unusual for our brains that it becomes a joke, but where's the actual problem here? Maybe there isn't one. I mean, sure, raiders and other shitholes may be people who were once babies, but so was Hitler and Stalin and Osama bin Laden and J. Edgar Hoover. I mean, if we start forgiving assholes for being assholes just because at one point they pooped their pants by mistake instead of immediately after getting bits of hot lead buried in their brain melons, then like, we might as well just give up now. Uh, some games, like Shadow of Mordor, are experimenting with new ways of presenting the enemy. Uh, it's a sort of blend of Hector and the run-of-the-mill henchmen. Uh, you know, orcs. They're orcs. They're meat sheaths for Aragorn's sword, Legolas's bow, and my axe. Shut up, Gimli! Shadow of Mordor introduces the nemesis mechanic that generates orc war chiefs that serve as a foil to your main character throughout the game. They have a name, they grow and change after every interaction they have with you. It's awesome. Unfortunately, this presents a new problem. If, if these war chiefs can be special Hectorian challenges to you, what, what about the other orcs? I mean, what? are orcs anyway. They're, they're a hell of a lot more human than super mutants. That, that's, that's for sure. And before you nerds get all frothy, I know. Orcs were created by elves and were tortured and misshapen by Melkor. Don't, don't even get started. Austin Walker explores this game in Real Human Beings, the new NPC, where he says that the, the evilness of the orcs serves one purpose, to justify the horrific behavior of Talion, who spends his time in the story using ghost powers to enslave and manipulate the savage orcs. Uh, Savage orcs that, hey, by the way, sing songs and write poetry and create art, the signifiers of culture. How do you make reprehensible actions seem justified? Well, you make the victims of those actions seem way, way worse. I mean, why do you think it's so easy to mow down Nazis or raiders or bandits? These storytelling tropes exist to further highlight how whatever you're punching or killing is, is, is different from you, an other that has it coming. And I, I know, uh, capital O other has some connotations, but, but it really fits here. I mean, the more different and non-person whatever you're interacting with seems, the easier it is to divorce yourself from empathy. And, in the case of like Zelda and Octoroks, it's it's based in a actual aesthetic design choice. It's a squid thing, not a person. In Fallout and Shadow of Mordor, it's because they're ineffably evil. In, in Mass Effect, it's because they're indoctrinated cyborg hybrids. As shown to us in the colossal battles between Achilles and Hector, Batman and the Joker, Link and Ganondorf, Mario and Bowser, violence between two people can exist to serve a narrative without mindless evaporation of humanity. I know, I know, I'm overthinking video games. I should probably rename the show Overthinking, but this isn't a small deal. I mean, these narrative structures exist in real life. I mean, 
the entire slave trade of North America was incredibly dependent on white people dehumanizing their black slaves. I mean, one, in order to help justify the terrible, terrible conditions these people were kept in, and two, in an attempt to get black people to accept their fate as subhuman, therefore making slavery easier to maintain. Modern warfare relies on this as well. I mean, the reason these storytelling elements are there to begin with is because they already existed in real life. How many stories about the world wars, the American Civil War, and hell, the Iraq War have you read? The, the, the casualties just kind of feel like a number, don't they? Uh, nameless, historyless, non-humans moving across the battlefield while the epic Winston Churchills and Adolf Hitlers played chess against one another. And, and propaganda totally worked to do this too. And don't think of the enemy as people, that just gets in the way. And research done by SLA Marshall after World War II revealed that only 25% of American infantrymen fire their weapons at enemy combatants because it turns out that it's goddamn hard to kill a person when you know that they're a person. Being able to dehumanize the enemy is a huge edge in combat. These questions and issues presented to us in video games, whether intentional or not, are incredibly important and deserve our full attention because just like Achilles in the Iliad, we are thrust into stories that are bigger than any of us, albeit we're at the whims of game designers instead of kings and gods. While we are at the whims and desires of those who created the story, we still have our agency, both within and without the game. And unlike the real world with its real war and real consequences, we're, we're free to go along with the story the way it's meant to be told, or we can push back against fate. We're free to experiment, examine, explore, and, and, and find our own way. We, we still may end up meeting our end the way it was meant to be, but you know, if there's one thing that game design and Greek myth have in common, it's fate. Thanks for watching. And what do you think? Should we take a closer look at how we treat cannon fodder in video games, or am I just overthinking it like I do just about everything else. I mean, in either case, it's not going to stop me from murdering my way through Fallout 4. I mean, don't forget to like the video if you liked it. If you didn't like it, uh, thanks for thanks for watching this far. Uh, you don't have to. You don't have to put a dislike down there. Uh, this video is brought to you by our generous supporters at Patreon who have donated their actual money to help keep this channel alive and thriving. So thank you very much. If you would like to contribute to Patreon, we have a link in the description and maybe a link over there. And you can go, and if you, if you can, it's no big deal. I actually just think it's awesome that you watch this video. So thank you so much. Oh, and if you want to read more about this, I have some references and links in the description below. Thank you so much, and I will see you in a couple of weeks.